Tonight we're going to get to hear what's been going on at Tomuspolik Cultural Institute and maybe a few comments towards what's coming up in the future. Right. So without any further ado, I would like you all to welcome Randall Melton. All right. Thanks, James. Nichalawit, Ineshwanisha, Wiala Chawisha, Ku Randall. Good evening. Uh, my name is Randall. Uh, I'm also known as Wiala Chawisha. That's the name that I took in the longhouse back home. And uh, that name means somebody that's going along and looking back. And uh, I'm actually Seminole and Creek from Oklahoma. That's the tribes that I come from. Uh, from my dad's side, uh, Scotch Irish from my mom's side. But uh, you, my grandpa, uh, you never said Scotch, it was only Irish, so uh, that's, uh, uh, that's where uh, my family comes from, back in Arkansas and Kansas uh, area. Uh, but I've lived on the Umatilla Indian Reservation since I'm about um, uh, nine years old, and uh, that's where uh, I was raised, that's where I've raised my family, uh, that's home to me. So um, I am uh, going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, my experiences at Tomaslik Cultural Institute uh, over the last 23 years that I've uh, worked with Tomaslik, uh, and uh, just give you a little bit of information about some of the things that have gone on uh, and, 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 and why Tomaslik was put together, uh, some of our uh, goals for the future, and what we've been up to lately. So uh, I'll just uh, uh, get started. So Tomaslik uh, was opened up in uh, 1998. For those of you who um, have been there, let me just get a quick show of hands. How many people have been to Tomaslik? All right, that's great. Um, and so uh, we've been uh, providing interpretation on behalf of the Cayuse, Umatilla, and the Walla Walla since 1998. But Tomaslik uh, was a goal of our community. Well, a cultural center was a goal of our community for a very long time. Um, if you look back at some of the original planning uh, that the tribe was doing in the 1970s, uh, you'll see that there was a museum or a cultural center that was part of those plans. Um, it took us until the sesquicentennial of the Oregon Trail uh, to get to the point where we were going to be uh, working towards opening a facility where we would house collection items that represented our culture to where we could interpret uh, what those items mean to us and talk about our history, our culture, our language from our point of view. Um, you see the mission statement there for Tomaslik. And um, this is a, a tribally owned and operated facility um, and the only one along the Oregon Trail that is tribally owned and operated. And when the Susquehanna uh, was being planned in the 1980s, late 80s, uh, there was uh, 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 one of the places that was selected as a possible place for one of those interpretive centers along the Oregon Trail what, in Oregon was um, Pendleton. And there was a Pendleton, uh, a good friend of ours, a lawyer from the city of Pendleton, who said, well, why don't we approach, approach the tribes and see if they'll get a cultural, build an uh, interpretive center about the Oregon Trail there. And so they came out and, and talked with tribal leaders and uh, they said they would do it for sure, uh, but uh, with a couple of caveats. One, that they would have full autonomy over the storyline that was going to be told. And number two, that uh, we would own and operate that building ourselves. It, wasn't, it wouldn't be owned by uh, the state or uh, federal or um, anybody else except for the tribes. And so uh, with that agreement, we started planning, doing some planning and uh, development of Tomaslik. So uh, these are uh, some images of the groundbreaking for Tomaslik. So this was in 1995, uh, but a couple of years uh, before that was when the Susquehanna Centennial was happening, 1993. And so while we were planning, while we were getting ready to build this facility, we did some living culture. Uh, if you remember, uh, if any of you were around the Pendleton area in, in 93, we had, uh, during uh, Pendleton Roundup and actually all through that summer, we had uh, areas set up over by the Roundup grounds where we had teepees set up and interpreters in there, young people talking about history, culture, language. Uh, and those were efforts to fundraise, to get the, get the word out that we were going to be uh, building this museum and to 
uh, represent the tribes during the sesquicentennial. But uh, two years later, in, in uh, the um, late fall of 1995, we did the groundbreaking for Tmuslicht. Uh Those two men that are on the right, those were two of our uh, chiefs. Um, both are past now. Uh, the one on the top uh, passed just this last year. And uh, the, uh, beneath him, that's uh, Carl Sampson. He passed uh, uh, just in the last uh, a few years. And uh, both those influential men, uh, both of those men carried a lot of stories, a lot of history, and had uh, regalia and things that they wanted to see kept safe uh, and for us to be able to tell uh, our story from our point of view. So um, that's them uh, giving, some, giving some words at the, um, at the groundbreaking. Those are uh, ceremonial chiefs of the uh, Walla Walla and the Cayuse tribe. Uh, so 1998, these are uh, some images of when we first opened up. And um, let me use this pointer here. So uh, this person here, uh, this is one of our elders here who was very important in getting the storyline together for the, for the exhibits. And uh, she, uh, not too long after that, passed. And so it was, um, as I said, it, it, was a, it was a dream, it was a vision, it was something that the community really, really wanted. A lot of those elders really felt that it was important for us to, to talk about how things used to be a very long time ago, how changes that have gone on um, over the last few hundred years uh, from our point of view, what we're up to nowadays, and our hopes for the future. So when we put the exhibits together, that's the design that was put together. Uh, we have the we were section, the we are section, and the we will be section, because one of the most important things that they talked about, those elders and, uh, and, and community uh, members, was that we wanted to make sure people knew we were still here. And if you think back to the 90s, uh, at this point when we opened up in 1998, the casino was only three years old. And so some of the things that we think about now uh, as just, uh, you know, accepted... Uh, reality were somewhat radical thoughts back in 1996, 97, 98 when we were putting these things together. Telling our story from our point of view, having a tribal member write those text panels and tell that history from our perspective, talking about events that have happened in our history like um, what happened at Wailip Poo, um, what happened when the reservation period was formed, and uh, other um, very important stories to us. Uh, they just weren't being told at that time from our perspective. They were being told from, uh, uh, and some of our stories were being used from a non-Indian perspective. So this was a great opportunity for us to be able to do that. So just uh, real quick to point out, and uh, I really was part of the crew back in 1998. That's me. That's uh, about, uh, I don't know, 40 pounds and... Uh, and gray hairs ago, but um, uh, we've had the same director, which has been a, a lifesaver for us. Uh, Roberta Connor, Bobby Connor, has been our director since we opened the facility. Uh, she came on board in 97. I was actually an intern when we were down at the Eco Economic and Community Development Office uh, before Tomaslik was built in 96 um, as, a, as a, a college student coming from uh, Whitman College. Um, and uh, actually my first museum job was over at Maxi Museum uh, at Whitman, uh, but um, had came back for the, after I got done, I transferred to Eastern Oregon University, finished up there, uh, and uh, came here to Tomaslik after having a summer at the Whitman Mission as an interpreter there, or well, as a summer intern there. Uh, so I got there right as we were getting ready to open. This was the opening uh, the tribal opening that we did. So we had a lot of our tribal members that we invited out uh, to see uh, the facility. And then I believe below here, this is when we, um, part of when we opened up to the public. This man here uh, is an important person to us. This is Tom Hampson. He was uh, in the original planning office for the tribes uh, back in the 70s and uh, helped uh, also to get together. If you've been to Muslick and heard the Coyote Theater story, um, he's the one who helped produce that story uh, for us and, and get, it, get the uh, storyline recorded and put together. So as I mentioned, the exhibits, this is We Were, We Are, We Will Be. Uh, there's a, uh, these first three pictures here are the We Were section. 
So uh, prehistory, pre-contact, the introduction of the horse, uh, leading up to uh, Lewis and Clark and the fort um, being uh, in the area. And then um, this section here, this was a very important uh, section of the exhibits to me personally, having worked over at the Whitman Mission um, and been on the grounds there, uh, having grown up in the community over there and heard about the Whit what happened at Whitman. Um, and if you've, if, if, if you've been around here long enough, you remember some of the uh, interpret interpretation that used to be there. Um, uh, some of that bothered me because it did talk about how uh, the missionaries were killed by people they came to save. And from our point of view, that's not how we saw it. So when we, were, when we opened up, um, some of the things we talked about, some of the reasons we talked about, about uh, the sickness that came through here, the measles that came through the area here that killed off a lot of the Cayuse people that were around the Whitman mission. And uh, having, a, having a reason why they asked the doctor to leave and asked him to shut that mission down. And when he didn't, the decision was made based on Cayuse law um, that uh, if a person works on somebody and, and that person dies, the family of that dead person can kill the doctor. And that is uh, Cayuse Law. That's something that didn't always happen, but it did happen. And uh, so these are, these, are, these are truths that we know that are just starting to come out back in 1998. Nowadays, we partner with the, with the Whitman Mission. We have a great relationship with them and, uh, and try to work with them. Uh, when we used to do our summer uh, um, living culture village, they would come over and present over there. Uh, we would send people over that way to uh, present as well. And so it's, a, it's a, quite a change from how things used to be. Um, then the We Are section, I just put a couple of pictures in here of the We Are section. And uh, the, the interesting thing, or the, thing, the challenge that we have is that this is who we, who we were in 1998. When the casino was only three years old, uh, there was a lot of um, economic development. There's a lot of changes that have happened in our community that are not represented in this area here. Uh, and a lot of the folks that are, that are represented in here have passed. Uh, we have a lot of kids in here that are now have kids of their own. Um, and so we, we're, we're hoping to get some of this updated and, and add some more information in. And then the last little section, uh, who, who we will be, there's some snippets of tribal members talking about their hopes for the future. And again, uh, these are hopes from uh, 1998's perspective. And uh, we have actually achieved some of the things that they talk about in, in the video that is associated with that section. Um, but also it, it lets us um, remind people that uh, we are still here. We have hopes for the future. That's the goal is to remember how things were a long time ago. We can't do everything the same way that it had had been, um, you know, uh, pre-contact, but uh, we still hold on to culture, still hold on to tradition and language, and uh, we try to do that in a modern world, uh, which is increasingly hard. Uh, we have the same problem as everybody else, getting faces off of screens um, and uh, getting people to uh, learn the language. When I started here at Tmuslicht in the 90s, there was about 30 master speakers in our language program. We're now down to less than a handful. Uh, of those master speakers. We have people that are proficient and that, uh, that are able to teach, but uh, they're also still learning themselves. Uh, we teach now the language uh, at the Head Start level. There's opportunities. We partnered with the Pendleton School District to teach language, not, not to us like we, but CTU, the tribe, um, the tribal language program, to teach languages in the kindergarten level for uh, any student, every student, uh, doesn't matter if you're uh, tribal or not, um, and that that's being now extended out to the first and second grade levels as well. At the high school level, we now have the opportunity to teach, uh, I believe there's a Nez Perce language class you could take as an elective at Pendleton High School, and uh, there's Nihiawe Community School, which is our charter high school that's part of the Pendleton School District, uh, or sponsored by Pendleton High School, and uh, out there, you can take language uh, as your foreign, uh, the native language as your foreign language credit instead of German, Spanish, or French. Um, and you're required to graduate from Nikiawe to have two years of the language. Um, and uh, so, so those are some of the ways we're trying to keep that going. But that's one of the things that's talked about uh, in that uh, section is 
the hope that our languages will be passed on to the younger generation. So we've, we've been working on that pretty hard as a tribe. Um, the temporary gallery that we have, we, when we started off, I apologize that the quality of the pictures aren't great because these are pictures from the 90s that when digital cameras weren't the best. Uh, but uh, we did, we tried to do some in-house photography uh, and, and any traveling show that we could that, uh, that related to tribal people specifically. Um, and uh, one of our big highlights was the Chihuly show. We, uh, we, brought, we borrowed a lot of uh, Pendleton blankets from Dale Chihuly and also some uh, glass vases that uh, were inspired by those blankets. We had those on display back in, I think it was 2002. Uh, but we tried to use that space to augment the permanent exhibits and to talk about uh, tribal art, um, tribal knowledge, and bring in some uh, uh, more historic artifacts, contemporary pieces and whatnot. Um, that's what we used uh, that temporary gallery for in the, in the early years. And then as we get further into uh, kind of starting to get our, our pace, um, in 2005, this was uh, uh, one of the biggest highlights I have had in my career was the opportunity to participate uh, in the, it would have been the um, 150th uh, anniversary of the signing of the treaty of 1855. Uh, we worked uh, very hard with the, uh, to, to meet requirements with the National Archives to bring our treaty uh, back home uh, for a period of time and have it on display. And uh, these are three pictures of that, um, that treaty coming back home, pages from that treaty coming back home. It had to have its own career that, that, uh, that came out with it. Uh, and made sure we were handling it properly. Uh, we had to have 24-hour security um, the entire time it was there uh, in, the, in the building or in the room uh, and a temperature community controlled case that was, that was specially built to house those documents. So the documents that we were able to bring back, this is um, uh, signature pages from the treaty. These are the three pages that talk really about um, the Sovereignty, uh, usual and custom area, fishing and hunting. Um, so some of our most important treaty rights are, are written there. Uh, our tribal leaders that were at the treaty council made their mark um, or signed their name on this page here. Uh, and uh, then the last is the uh, ratification of the treaty that was signed by the president. And um, that was to have those come back into our uh, area, to our homeland, uh, to be on display and be interpreted from our perspective, that was a, that was a big day for us. That was a big event. And, uh, and for myself to be one of the people that got to handle those items as they came out of the crate, um, you know, it was, uh, like I said, that's the, probably the highlight of my career is, is being involved with that treaty exhibit. <clears throat> and that was 2005. Uh, then uh, we started adding in uh, uh, more contemporary uh, shows and more contemporary themes. Uh, one of the things we did, one of the first shows that I was in charge of was the James Lavador Properties of Paint. That's this exhibit up here. And uh, uh, we, uh, they threw me right in on the deep end. There was, I had to fill this entire gallery with Jim Lavador paintings. Uh, and if you know Jim, he doesn't do anything small. Uh, the, these were all individual pieces that had to be uh, you know, put on the wall and they have to be one inch by one inch all the way so that this is uh, what, five, 15 different panels that had to be exactly spaced apart. And that's just, this is just one section. It was the whole, the whole gallery was full of these. And so it was quite a challenge, but, uh, but uh, one of my favorite shows that we've got to do, we did the uh, Tall in the Saddle, which was the 100th anniversary of the Pendleton Roundup. Um, in 2016, uh, or sorry, 2011, we worked with uh, Oregon Historical Society and had Jackson Sundown Saddle and um, uh, George Fletcher, Fletcher's Shaps and uh, various other uh, famous um, uh, regalia and uh, accoutrement from the uh, Pendleton Roundup over the years. We did an Alcatraz exhibit. Uh, which was interesting. We had a lot of people coming in and say, why do you have an Alcatraz exhibit here? And that was our opportunity to talk about Indian civil rights from the 1970s uh, when a group of um, native people from 
San Francisco uh, and Oakland uh, took over Alcatraz Island for a period of time uh, and claimed it as Indian land. And uh, so we were able to have that exhibit and explain why uh, that was an important step for us in getting to uh, where we're at today, which is self-determination. That's the Indian, federal Indian policy that we're in right now. Uh, we did a, a sports exhibit, one of my favorites too, uh, a few years back. These are all um, the picture here with the basketball jerseys. This is uh, uh, Shoni Schimmel. Uh, she was a, a, a tribal member from here who went on to play at Louisville and then uh, went on to play in the WNBA. And uh, so she, for the Atlanta Dream and, um, and then uh, she, went, she played for Team USA and also her sister Jude Schimmel also played for Louisville and uh, so we were able to uh, local heroes bring her some of her uh, some of their items in and put them on display uh, also we had some of Jim Thorpe's um, uh, medals and some of his certificates that were signed by Pop Warner who was the athletic director at the school that um, Jim Thorpe was at uh, Carlisle Indian School so we were able to uh, have some of those on display. And then uh, one of a, a really, another really great one is the Roots of Wisdom show that we did. That one was a combination uh, that we did with the um, Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, OMSI, uh, and some other tribal partners to talk about traditional ecological knowledge and, um, and Western science, putting those things together in order to manage resources. Uh, and so we've had a lot of great partnerships that we've done over the years. As James mentioned, we are partners with uh, Fort Walla Walla and we, uh, uh, we, try to, um, oops. we try to reach out to as many of our um, area partners as we can to try to work on projects as they come up. I also want to show out uh, some of the events and uh, programs that we've done over the years. Um, this top picture, this is the treaty symposium that we did in, I think it was 2000. Um, and the man sitting right back here, this was our first tribal attorney. His name is Charles Luce. And uh, he helped us. He was a pretty young guy, uh, fresh out of law school. Uh, the tribes hired him and he helped us to uh, take uh, the, the federal government to court to get... Um, compensation for the loss of Celilo Falls uh, in the 1950s. So we were able to put in a, a, a claims commission, or we put in a claim to the Indian Claims Commission and ask for reimbursement or compensation for the loss of that fishery when the Dow's Dam was put in. But he was the man who was responsible, uh, uh, or he was the man who was representing us um, in, that, in that fight. Uh, Noel Rood sitting right here. This was our linguist for, for a number of years. Uh, and helped us get to the point where we could publish the Umatilla Dictionary that we uh, published um, not too many years ago. Uh, Anton Minthorn, a tribal leader here, he was a member uh, or the uh, chair of the Board of Trustees, also general council chairman, and uh, helped with uh, some of the storyline. Some of the objects that you see on display at Tumuslet come from his family, and uh, he's uh, uh, definitely made his mark uh, on the... Um, policy and governance level for the tribe. And this is, um, this is Dr. Ruby. Uh, if you've ever read the book Cayuse Indians, that is, uh, he's one of the authors, uh, a dear friend of ours who's passed. Um, and uh, we, in, in the early 2000s, republished that book Cayuse Indians with a forward and a, uh, some appendix information uh, from the tribe's point of view. Uh, Bobby here in the center is working, this is a re the Reservation Roadshow, one of my favorite programs that we did, where we invited people to bring their heirlooms in, and we had a um, photo uh, appraiser, uh, we had a artifact appraiser, and um, a book appraiser, and then a conservator there. And so you could bring your items in, they would take a look at it and tell you what uh, kind of the market value is, uh, if you wanted to know. Uh, and then uh, the conservator would tell you how to take care of those things. So it was an opportunity for us to see what was in the community uh, and uh, to, cr to create some partnerships, to, to meet people, and uh, to eventually some of those items came to the museum as donations. Um, and uh, for the community, it was a great way for them to learn a little bit more about the thing that they had had in their family and, uh, and what, um, what it might be worth. Uh, 
Uh, the Kids Pow Wow, this is a great event that we did uh, for a number of years. We haven't done, have been able to do it the last couple of years, but uh, we invite all the kids out and uh, they uh, get to dance. And whether that be in regalia or out of regalia, uh, whether they're tribal or not, we invite them out uh, and we have uh, uh, gifts that we give them, including school supplies and other things uh, that, we, uh, that we hand out to the kids. So it's a great event. Um, this is a group of visitors at the museum playing stick games uh, with Jess, one of our, he's now our facility manager, or he used to be uh, an interpreter for the museum, so we're small enough that uh, everybody does a little bit of everything, and he ended up specializing in facilities, and later on helped to get the solar panels and the wind turbine that we have um, in our parking lot. Uh, the only place on the reservation that has a wind turbine, uh, one of few that has solar panels um, in, on the reservation, so um, trying to work towards uh, net zero uh, carbon footprint. Um, and then uh, this is just a picture of us over uh, doing some outreach over at Sacagawea Sac State, State Park and, um, and presenting to people that were coming through for a public program. So we've, we've tried to do quite a, a bit of uh, outreach when we can and also um, different programming and different uh, books we've been able to publish uh, based on events like that treaty symposium that we did a number of years back. Um, all of these things are, uh, are possible because we, are, we do have this facility where we're trying to keep track, trying to be that national archive for the tribes um, and, uh, and to make sure that the, that information is available for future generations. Um, I just had a couple pictures here of the last uh, year and a half. Um, we shut down last uh, March and uh, didn't open the exhibits back up until May of this year. Uh, when we did open back up, it was to a pretty small crew and uh, we have been working hard to uh, get uh, folks back into the exhibits uh, to see uh, the permanent exhibits. We don't really have any temporary exhibits right now, but we plan to use that space. We hope to use that space to bring in new visitors who might not come to see a tribal museum. So we've done things in the past, like have uh, Andy Warhol uh, paintings in there, um, Charlie Russell uh, artwork there. Um, that Alcatraz exhibit brought uh, a various uh, group of people in. We did a World War II um, uh, exhibit called Deadly Medicine uh, that talked about uh, the use of, uh, the, the Nazis use of uh, medicine and um, eugenics, and uh, related that uh, also to uh, the local area and tribal communities. Um, and so we hope to use that temporary gallery to do that again in the future to bring in uh, new people. But um, I just had a picture there of some of the, the younger people um, who were probably not even born when I started working at the museum, um, but standing in front of one of our signs that has a picture of raccoon and uh, saying, uh, please wear your mask like a raccoon wears his mask. We have uh, some uh, with Otter washing his hands in the bathroom uh, and reminding people to wash their hands. And also we have a sign that says, please stay one bull elk or one eagle apart and uh, pictures of them on there. So trying to do some social distancing, uh, but adding a little bit of cultural um, flavor to it. Um, it's been uh, a difficult uh, uh, to keep the uh, exhibit wing open and to do that public programming that we like to do uh, and uh, to do the outreach that we have. We haven't really been able to do that. So we're just now starting to get back to our feet underneath us, but still with a smaller staff. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a rough go. We did redo the outside of the building. That's what the other picture is there for. Uh, for since we opened up, we were covered in uh, redwood on the outside and, uh, and stone. And um, that just has never been a good uh, fit for us because of the wind and the rain that uh, comes through on the flats where we're at. And so we, uh, just this last year, uh, during COVID, we uh, did a uh, full envelope change over and put a new roof on and put uh, siding onto the outside of the building. So if you come to Tomaslik, you'll see uh, it looks uh, quite a bit different from the outside. Um, we do have the, the picture in the center there is, a, is a, the front cover of a plan that we worked with our original exhibit designers and uh, to, to upgrade and refresh 
uh, revitalize the exhibits because we understand the fact that uh, everything that's happened from 98 to now is not represented very well in the exhibits. And that includes uh, from the top uh, on the left, that's the Nick Yahweh Governance Center. Then uh, next to that to the right is Yellowhawk Tribal Health Center, Nick Yahweh Community School, Nick Yahweh Community Financial Services, which is a CDFI the tribes just opened about a month and a half ago. Um, that is, uh, we're working towards getting our own um, bank system on the reservation, credit union, uh, and then uh, Cayuse Technologies, which is our software development company. So there's been so much change that's not represented in there. We wanna get these things in there. A lot of economic development. The tribes in the last year bought uh, Hamleys, the um, Western store and the steakhouse that's uh, right near, right on Main Street there in Pendleton. Also purchased the Pendleton Country Club uh, and uh, it's now the Birch Creek Golf Course. Uh, so um, the tribes were able to purchase that last year as well. And so a lot of change, a lot of uh, information that we'd like to give and really what we try to do when visitors are coming in is to, to, to really tell them that um, the economy was the first step. Rebuilding the economy, the changes that have, that uh, uh, caused that economy to go away of, of traveling seasonally, trading with our regional partners, uh, fishing at Celilo and other places. Uh, when that went away, there was such a long period of time of uh, survival mode and dependency that uh, now that we're able to start to really um, take care of our community and have the opportunities for people to work on the reservation, we, we want to tell that story in the exhibit. So look for that. Uh, we're, we're about two years out from our 25th anniversary. And uh, so the goal is to take those exhibits to focus on the we were section, the we will be, or sorry, the we are section and the we will be section and really uh, upgrade those, update those, uh, and tell the story, the continuing story. And that's, uh, and that's uh, again, what it's all about is just to make sure that people know that we are continuing on. We're not something from the past. We're still here. We're still working uh, uh, for a better future for our community. And that, include, that means working with uh, regional uh, partners and friends. Um, so I think that's what I've got. Yeah, do you have, does anybody have any uh, uh, questions? Yes. Um, what was the treaty and what was it called? Yeah, the treaty, uh, so uh, the treaty was signed in 1855 uh, and that's, that's what formed the, uh, the Umatilla Indian Reservation. That's what joined the three tribes, Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla together to become the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. But when that treaty was signed, what it did was <clears throat> the, the area that those three tribes traveled around and they followed a season around, followed the foods, uh, and it was uh, 6.4 million acres or 8,000 square miles. When they signed that treaty, they ceded that 6.4 million acres to the federal government. They were to retain about a half a million acres, but when the treaty was ratified four years later, it actually uh, was uh, written down as 250,000 acres. And then through allotment and some of the other uh, uh, laws and acts that were passed, the size of the reservation diminished further. Right now it's at about 172,000 acres. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any? Yes? What school um, did you say has a Nez Perce? Uh, he, yeah, so uh, Pendleton High School has a Nez Perce language class that they offer as an elective. Uh, and Nick Yahweh Community School offers right now Umatilla and Nez Perce classes. Um, we, we don't have a Walla Walla class right now, um, uh, but that in the past they've offered all three of those languages. And, and there is a, there's a printed Umatilla dictionary that, uh, that the tribes produce and that, uh, that Tomaslik helped uh, uh, and has available there. And I don't know if you have any here or not, but um, also, there is an online version of the Umatilla Dictionary that was just released not too long ago, and that's, that's uh, free to the public. You just have to Google Umatilla Online Dictionary. It goes Umatilla to English, English to Umatilla, so it's, it's actually really uh, useful and a, and a great tool. Uh -huh. Does anybody else have any questions? All right, I'm, I'm going to be here, uh, and, uh, and we'll be around to... Uh, to visit with you folks afterwards and uh, 
And thank you so much for thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it.